Hi everybody, I am I'm very, very blessed to be able to talk to Mr. Peter Freedstone today, who was uh, Freddie Mercury's personal assistant for about 12 years, I believe. And thank you for joining us here. And you are, whether you're in Estonia at the moment. I am in Estonia at the moment, currently on a tour. Still, I suppose, Queen Music, um, the Queen Rhapsody um, with Natalia Poznova. She's this amazing classical pianist who has recreated Queen songs and orchestrated some of them. And it's a whole show of piano, orchestra, some live vocals with a real good rock singer voice, amazing drums and guitar, but then but no, get, no guitar, bass, and he's brilliant, um, <laughs> and an orchestra with the whole thing. It's, it's really an amazing show. And that's, yes, I am in Estonia on tour with that. Fantastic. What's your, what's your role with them? Ah, oh, what do I do? I go on, <laughs> have a little chat in the beginning, in the first part, then have a little chat and play a little bit of piano in the second half. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. And our mutual friend, uh, um, Gordon McNeil set this up for us, and I assume he's the he's the incredible drummer that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I I actually no, I mean this is the truth. I heard a lot of drumming yesterday. This poor guy started at three o'clock in the afternoon. He was allowed off his seat at six thirty in the evening because they were opening the doors. And then he went through a two and a half hour set, and I mean, it, it was wonderful. It was amazing. I really, it, I really enjoyed it. Well, good. He's, you, you guys are getting your money's worth then, by the sounds of it. Like the audiences, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> the audiences. That's amazing. We got, we got to tape our little camera as well. So basically, yes, I, I understand the, uh, the interesting uh, issues that we have with technology. <laughs> yeah, because well, look. Not so long ago, this wouldn't exist. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, I, I, I've got kids that are growing up with all of this stuff to be commonplace, and for us, it's still new. And Yeah, but the thing is, looking at what's behind you, yeah. that's what I used to work around. Right. Which is nice, to see old, older equipment. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Rather than just three computer screens in a row and a little keyboard in front of it. Yeah, exactly. When they hear that they're coming to my home studio, these days expect to see exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you know, a... Um, yeah, three monitors and a little Apple keyboard or something, and that's it. That's, yeah. that's the studio. No, no, but the thing is, with what you have there, it looks like you do work. Oh, <laughs> we, yeah, we work. I've got a... I've got a red special over there with Brian's new ones. Uh -huh. So yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I mean, you know, I would consider myself to be, you know, successful in the music industry. Um, but I, 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 it all came from my love of Queen as a kid. I'm sure, uh, Gordon probably gave you a little bit of background. Yeah. My, uh, my father who recently died, um, bought me a night at the opera for Christmas and he only listened to, only listen to classical music and a tiny amount of jazz. So I used to get dragged to Covent Garden and all this kind of stuff, which now, of course, I absolutely love. But when I was a kid, I was like, <laughs> you know. Yes. And he gave me a night at the opera and said to me, this is worthy. Okay. No, I mean, for me, um, I used to do my school homework listening to Wagner overtures. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you then wrote really amazing stories and things. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, it's, inter it's interesting how um, orchestra is, th there was probably a time, I think maybe where we thought that, oh, this is gonna be, it's gonna be out of date. It's no longer gonna be used. But the thing about orchestra is it's so much music and heritage, it's never gonna go away. It, it, as no. soon as as soon as you hear a violin or a cello in 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 a in a movie or something, it just brings up so much emotion. Oh, of course, the thing is, um, you ha have to remember the Barcelona album, nineteen eighty eight. 
Every single instrument on that was a keyboard. It was all keyboard in 1988. 2012, I was there in Prague when an 88-piece orchestra reorchestrated the Barcelona album. Amazing. You can tell. You can hear the difference. Yeah. You still can hear. Even It doesn't matter how good keyboards are. If you sit it and compare a keyboard and an orchestra, a whatever instrument, you can tell which is real. I agree entirely. I think, but I, I realized this just recently because I was in Air Studios a couple of weeks ago and I was up in the balcony and it was a London Symphony and they were, they were recording. And what I realize is it's not even about the sound of the instrument. It's the fact that every player in that room is into playing from each other. They're all working from mm-hmm. each other. There was yes. one solo girl singer, and when she sang, the orchestra just dropped behind us so beautifully. No PA, mm-hmm. no microphones, just the recording. Oh, yeah. And yeah, the yeah, problem yeah. is is that you can give me all of that technology to, to play back the most perfectly recorded sounds, but I can't think like 40 or 50 people. I can't put myself in all those yeah. situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I agree entirely, 100%. I think the only things I want to sort of hit on are, are really what you, you may know of his journey up until he was 17 or 18, what he may have told you before he came to England, because I think that's the one thing what maybe shaped him, because in an interview, he's like super, super shy, like super, super shy. And then, and then he'd get on stage and he's the world's greatest performer. That's my I'm not saying that for dramatic effect. That's my actual belief. No, that was that was Freddie Mercury. Yeah, there, there, there were two. There were two of them. Yeah, um, both as real as each other. Um, there was the one that the whole world knows, the one who had the whole world in the palm of his hand for Live Aid, and there was this guy who would put on tracksuit, mismatched if necessary, whatever came close to hand when he got out of bed. Yeah. Um, come down for his breakfast always at nine o'clock. It didn't matter if he went to bed at five in the morning or three in the morning. He would always get up at nine because he didn't like wasting time. Right. And while there was daylight, it was time. Yep. There wasn't enough minutes in a day. But he would have his breakfast and go and play with his cats in the garden. Right. I mean, he would just, it was just that, that, that was him. He had a lot of suits, if you know what I mean. Yep. Um, he had, when he got up in the morning, he was naked. It was Freddie Mercury, mm-hmm. the, the, the person within. Um, if he was going to have a lunch, he would already, even though it was with friends, he would put on Freddie Mercury, the entertainer. Because it was his house, he wanted to entertain his guests. He wanted them to feel comfortable. He wanted. He was so proud of the house, he wanted to show them the house, even though they might have seen it 10 days before. He'll have bought something new and have to show that off. Right. Um, and then when he went out, as I said, when he was in the house, he didn't have to bother. But as soon he, as he was outside the front gate, he would be in trainers, jeans, T-shirt, leather jacket, and sunglasses. He would have the next suit on. He came what the world expected. Sure. He was very accommodating that way. (laughs) I mean, because he had such humble beginnings, do you think that, uh, I mean, that wanting to show off, you know, look at this thing I've bought, look at my house, look at this stuff, because I I, I sort of relate to that. I think for many of us, you know, as we achieve things, we're sort of, proud of it but we're also sort of like wow look at this still waking up yeah. every day uh, amazed that you have anything you know oh yeah because the thing is he freddie appreciated and to this to a degree he loved his fans because he knew without them he would have absolutely nothing you know um he really very he talked very very little about, bef- I mean, the days before before Queen yeah. started. You know, he didn't really talk about when he first arrived in England. He didn't talk about his, the initial relationship with Mary. 
this was all things that were in the past that he, I mean, he really didn't talk about. But, I mean, I, he and I understood each other basically because, and I firmly believe this, we both of us had a very similar upbringing. Freddie was in a boarding school in India for, I think it was about seven or eight years. His boarding school was near Bombay. I was five years in a boarding school in India, in South, in South India. Oh, Different wow. time, obviously, because he was nine years older than me. Um, but the thing is, I understood why he didn't have to call his parents every day. He didn't have to talk <laughs> to his mother every day. He didn't, you know, which is, I, I suppose it is all around the world, but I know it's very much a British thing that it's family. You have to keep together. You know, blood, yeah. blood thicker than water, and all that. But if you go to a boarding school, you—I mean, you know that family are there; they exist. But it's the friends you spend every day of the week with that become more important. You rely on your friends. You don't rely on the family that are a few thousand kilometers away. And so I never questioned that he didn't ring his mother every week or didn't ring her every day or didn't, you know, when he was in the UK, he would see her maybe once in three months because she wanted to see him. <laughs> you know, his, sure. his mother would say, look, you haven't come and seen us for so long. Come, you must come, you must come. You. And so he went over to spend some time with them. It didn't mean that he didn't love them, that he loved them any less. It's just that family was compartmentalized it had its place freddie never mixed family and the rest of his life the music side i mean his private life they the family had their place and that's where it always was i mean when they came to england he came with very little i mean he, um, <laughs> you, I think it says it all when, in an interview they they did with Freddie's mother, where she said, "Well, the big difference between um, Zanzibar and London was we had to give up the servants." <laughs> so um, they had some money to live on. He he worked for the British government. Right. So they had money coming in, but it wasn't a fortune. They couldn't, it wasn't that they could splash out on things. And so that's how Freddie grew up. His mother would complain because he, he was in, he went to dis, doing design at Eileen, somewhere in Eileen. Um, <laughs> and she complained because he used one of her tablecloths to make a shirt that he designed. Beautiful. So, you know, it wasn't as though he could go out and buy material and all that sort of stuff. Right. I mean, so when he was in the position to buy things, mm -hmm. then he was one of these, the very, very few people who had taste and could afford it. Mm -hmm. Most people have the money and no taste. <laughs> yes, we definitely know that one. <laughs> um. But he had, and the thing is also, it wasn't, he wouldn't only go out and buy stuff for himself. He would always think of everybody around him. And I, I remember once he came downstairs complaining bitterly that he had no colognes, that nobody cared about him, nobody bought him anything, which basically meant he had about three half bottles of right. something up there. I'm going out to sort something out for myself. Right. So he went out with his driver. They went to Harrods. He came back. I mean, he wasn't carrying them, obviously. The driver was. Um, but came back with two bags from Harrods. And he looked through them and took out one bottle of cologne. See, now, I've bought this for me. This is mine. This is... And then he proceeded to give everybody, including the cleaning ladies and everybody who was in the house, he went through the bags, giving everybody perfume, colognes, 
things. That was that was just the way he was. Right. You know, he knew he had the money. He wanted people to enjoy it. He worked very, very hard for it. So, absolutely. I I, I just read the other day, and I, I don't know if this is is true that 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 Bohemian Rhapsody was started in the '60s as a as an idea, and it, he just sort of like continually built it over a long period of time. Because I've never actually heard a song as famous as that. The title of the movie, everything. Uh, there's no sort of backstory, and considering how massively important it is, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's very, very true. Um, I don't think when he started making it, it wasn't designed as the you know most extraordinary, most elaborate six minute. <laughs> track um yeah, yeah i don't think this was a song that he had running through his head when he started creating it you know a lot of musicians already have the song before they actually then start with sort of some keyboards a bit of guitar some vocal tracks going in there and of course the drum track to start everything off it wasn't like that um i do believe that there were it it, it was an amalgamation of two or three tracks that he had thoughts about, but he didn't know where any of them would go. Right. And it wasn't until he got into the studio that things started coming together that he could put, because Freddie, I don't know how he would work in this day and age, because nowadays everybody records everything on their computer at home then goes to a studio to have it mixed. Right. But he refused always to have any sort of equipment at home. <laughs> he had his piano that he composed Bohemian Rhapsody on. That was there. But there was no, no, no equipment. Studio, home was home. That was his quiet life away from work. Studio was the office. Studio was where he went to work. He needed that sort of environment to create things. He needed an emotional jolt. He would create an argument before he went to the studio so that he would go there fuming and he would create some of the most amazing things. Right. I know it's unbelievable. I, But I think, and this is just coming to me, it, the fact that he was, because I never knew any of these details, I mean, any of us do, the fact that he didn't have a home way of recording is probably the thing that we love about it, this sort of, this classical kind of approach is starting to make more sense to me now because if you're Beethoven and you're writing something, you're not turning on your, you know, you're not getting your cell phone and recording the idea. So it, it has a sense of humanity and an evolution that can only come from memorizing and then maybe recalling it slightly wrong and getting a different idea rather than sort of like laying something down in stone. Because these days I find that I'm recording an idea and it's getting passed around by to people and we're all adding our thing to it. Yeah. But it which sort of loses a lot of that organic, natural development that yes. would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it loses what your original thought would have been. Right. Because as soon as other minds come in. But the thing is, with Queen, it in fact worked sort of the other way around because each of them knew the expertise of the others in the band. Um, one person would come in with an idea but the end result was five people's work. Right. With the four members of the band and the producer, who sort of kept things under control <laughs> to a degree. Um, but each, each of the people might have come in with the germ, but they knew that they could rely on John and his bass. They, you just needed to tell him what you, what you needed, what what. what just get that initial beat in there. And they knew that there was no worry where that was concerned. Right. Brian could provide any sort of guitar sound that you want. Right. And the thing is, the way Fred, Freddie recorded, he would have this idea in his head, but he could not put anything down 
until he had a drum track. And he refused, even when it was available, to have an electronic click. And Roger had mm -hmm. to sit with the bass drum just going doof, 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 five minutes, because Freddie trusted Roger's foot more than he did any sort of machinery. And the thing is, a, sort of a little added story onto that, um, you know, Freddie did some recording with Michael Jackson. They worked on three tracks. Freddie was only there for one day, for about eight hours. I was there. Michael's track, State of Shock, was almost complete, so Freddie put his vocals on it. Then, to work from the other side, Freddie was working on the track, There Must Be More to Life Than This. He had in his mind the piano, you know, the piano, what he needed, what he wanted. And he had a few words written down. And so the original track and the track that was used to recreate the Queen version of a couple of years ago was just Freddie playing the piano and Michael singing live to that, singing the words that Freddie had created. And if you listen to that original track, you have, you hear Freddie say, because the words run out, and Michael says, well, what now? And Freddie says, ad lib, ad lib. And then Michael just added words to it. Then there was, they decided they wanted to do a track from the beginning together. And it had the sort of working name of Victory. But Freddie still needed his drum beat. And the thing is, you have to realize in this studio at this point, there was a sound guy, and that's it. There was a sound engineer. There was no musicians, there was no anybody. Michael's vocal booth was in fact a toilet outside the studio because that gave the best sound he found. And he says, okay, I've got an idea for this drum. I, you know, if you have to have a drum, we'll have a drum. And I spent five minutes banging the toilet door, <laughs> which was the initial drum beat for this third song that they never really did a lot of work on. Well, you know, where there's a will, where the, there's a way, try something out. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> But That's I mean, amazing. I, I, I still imagine me just seeing me opening and shutting this door <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> oh. I haven't obviously yet seen the movie. I think we'll probably air this around about the time that it comes out. You've been on set considerably, been involved. and uh... I was in London for five months last wow. year from middle of August to the middle of December. For the first six weeks, it was pre-production, and I just spent my time in the production office talking with production designer, um, props, sets, costumes, wigs, makeup, anything. I was just there to answer the questions, any questions they had. I had I took in all my photographs. So they scanned all the photographs to get, because the thing is they wanted everything. It's a film. It's not a documentary. But they wanted to have everything as precise as it could possibly, you know, as, as real as it could possibly be. They wanted to know what pattern was on the cup and saucer that Freddie would have his tea out of every morning. They were, he used to have a shoulder bag. They asked me, what did he used to have in the shoulder bag? And so I said, well, I mean, there was always the latest, latest architectural digest. There was always a hand mirror and a hairbrush, just in case wherever he was going, there would be press possibly around. He would have cigarettes, lighter, strepsils, and his, his birthday book. Birthday book? What's a birthday book? So it's a small padded book, brown, colours on it. And he had every friend's birthday in it. 
because he never missed any friend's birthday. And he would also have his Polaroid camera in. Two days later, they showed me a brown shoulder bag with an architectural digest, a hand mirror, a brush. Everything that I had said was inside that bag. They would never film inside the bag. But if Freddie had to have it on when in, in, during a scene, he would have the correct, Rami would have the correct weight in the bag that would then move his shoulder up, down. That was the sort of detail they wanted. That's beautiful. It's great to hear. I'm, I'm incredibly excited to hear, to see the movie. Well, the thing is, I would then, the filming, the main filming started and I spent 85% of the film, I was sitting behind the director in the big boy's tent um, where the director and the two monitors were and there was script supervisor, myself and the producer. And so I was there for the actual filming of each scene. And occasionally, um, Brian would ask, but, but well, Freddie, would he have really acted exactly like that? And I said, well, maybe not exactly like that, but I mean, it fits for the script, it fits for the, th but what would Freddie have done? And so I described how Freddie would be. So then they try and shoot it the other way how it's edited, like you say, I will see it at the same time. Um, because the big world premiere, I will be on this tour. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> see. Moment. So I will, I'm not, I will not be in Wembley. But I will be seeing it three times before the official release in Czech Republic and another time in Poland. Right. Because it's released on the 1st of November there. Oh, lovely. Um, and so I've been invited to a pre-premiere and a this and a that and everything else. So I'll see it. I will see it. Did you watch rushes though? You know, during during the making, did you no. see? No, 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 no. There were so many times that three or four times I had to leave the tent because I could feel lump in my throat hmm. because it might. It, they were they were, they were filming a scene that I wasn't physically present at, at the time. But the way it had been written and the way it was performed by all the band members, it was exactly as the, I could 100% believe that that is what had happened, that that's how it happened. There's this, this, this film will take people through, you know, a roller coaster of emotions. I mean, there's, there's going to be things to laugh at. There's things to smile about, and there will be things to cry about. As I say, though, it is not a documentary. This is a film that is telling a story using amazing music. And it's, there are enough real facts in there to make it true. It's beautiful. I, for me, I'm just, I, I'm massively excited about the fact that this is going to introduce so many more people to this music that we all know and love. And that is, that is such a massive thing for me. It's wonderful. We were just looking on uh, Spotify the other day that in all the hundreds and thousands of bands in the world, Queen, Queen are one of two or three only what we now call legacy artists in the top 100 on Spotify. So even, even though Spotify as a medium is entirely about, not entirely, but largely based towards, you know, younger people. Young, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they were like number 75 in the world where the most people using Spotify are quite young. And I think that's such a massive testament to just how incredible yeah. the songs are. Well, the thing that I have found, strange, you have to remember, I'm just an old man now. So still just getting used to technology. <laughs> um, so, but following all these different social media, media, you know, the Facebook, Instagram, all of this sort of stuff, just watching what is going on with all these people who 
weren't even born at the beginning of this century, never mind born and able to have to say that they heard Freddie singing with Queen. I mean, you have to be 45 now to have heard Freddie singing with Queen. But you look and there's all these young teenagers on these um, social media sites and you, they, they can't stop talking about this film. They can't stop talking about the band. Um, they've, as you, you, as you, you use the word legacy artist. Queen, Fred, I don't think Freddie ever dreamt that we would be doing this, mm -hmm. what we, you and I are doing now. I don't think he would ever have dreamt that this would be happening nearly 30 years after he died. He knew he was a good artist. He knew he was a good musician. He knew he created some amazing music. But I don't think he ever dreamt it would go as long as it has and still be as popular as it is. But then I keep saying to myself, we still listen to Mozart, don't we? Exactly. Yep. I mean, that time, you know, the 70s through the 80s, all of those artists, um, when I look at like Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush and Bowie and, and Queen, mm. and they combined everything for me. It wasn't just the music, it was the artistry, you know, the visual aspects, everything yeah. was there. It was a complete, it was a complete thing. And it's, I think it's just hard to get away from, like you're saying, you know, you're making the comparison to Mozart. When something is that great on so many levels, not just one level, but on so many yes. levels. Um, I, yes, I suppose there he is in, in the mid 80s, surrounded by these Gabriels and these Kate Bushes, and he's just yes. like, oh, I'm just one of many people. But now we look at it, yes. we look at it and realize that those were the people. Yeah, the thing is, those were people, every one of them, who had to work so hard. Yeah to become who they have become, who they became. It wasn't a case of going into a studio, singing three words, then go back to the studio a week later and someone's created a song out of it for you. These were all artists who wrote their own stuff, who recorded their own stuff, who had to come up with visuals, that had to come up with Everything, because that was those were the days when video became so important. So not only did you have to think about the music that you were writing, you then had to think about, oh, well, what's going to be the single? What can we do for this video? You know, I mean, Queen were involved all the way through with all of their things. They would decide a director for a single. An idea would be put forward. An idea would be accepted. And then Freddie would spend the rest of the time working with the director to get the end result. And that would be on any, any and every video. Freddie choreographed everything that went through. Um, and yet, Freddie on stage was never once choreographed. You could go to two shows in a row, in different stadiums, same stadium. He was never in the same place twice. He just did what he felt from within him. When I first met Freddie, where he was doing this um, ballet gala with the Royal Ballet. And of course, this was 1979. He thought, you know, he was wearing these, you know, body suits, ballet shoes, because he thought he was so balletic. And it wasn't until he had to rehearse with the Royal Ballet that he found he had two left feet. Um, and even the people who were doing the choreography for the piece, he sang Crazy Little Thing Called Love and Bohemian Rhapsody. But the, and they, they were, had done choreography for everything, but he just couldn't, he couldn't understand it. He couldn't do it. That was just something he could not do. He could not be choreographed. It was hard enough when they had to do multiple takes on videos for him to remember which foot was put forward first, you know, um, because he, he was very spontaneous. He just, if he wanted to do something, he did it. 
I completely understand that. I mean, that's, I suppose that is the ultimate artistic freedom. Yeah, and the thing is, he deserved what he got. He, he, as I said, all of them, all of the artists that you mentioned, they worked hard for everything they had. And so did Freddie. But he was never scared of hard work. I think for me, the thing that draws me to Queen is out, just talking about the music now, not even all of the other incredible things that they, they brought was the fact that um, they never rested on any kind of laurels whatsoever. Uh, I mean, I remember at the time, Brian May making a, making a statement that, okay, we've done Bohemian Rhapsody. It's this massive worldwide smash. Now we could put out Profit Song. And it's got, you know, similar operatic approach. It will probably shoot back up to number one. Instead, they put out You're My Best Friend, which was obviously subsequently a very smart move because it's one of the biggest radio songs of all time in America. But it was a statement of like, they went from this massively operatic six minute odd piece to a, you know, little perfectly crafted love song from John Deacon to his wife. And, and yeah. And then the game comes along in 1980, and it's a 50 song. You know, I I, I know kids that think Elvis yes. Elvis wrote that song. And then there's a disco song in it with another one bites the dust. And then there's some more traditional sides like play the game and save me. And then you've got a rock side with Dragon Attack. I mean, oh, yeah. that's what we love about all of our artists. At least you know we we love that diversity, never resting on their laurels. And in one sense, you could say, well, Bohemian Rhapsody, it's, they're very intelligent. It's an intelligent, crafted song. And then crazy little thing called Love's got like four chords. So, <laughs> so that Freddie could play them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's that, that's, the, that's the beauty. And that's what, that's what um, has, even after that initial falling in love with the night of the opera, that's what kept me being a fan, has kept me a fan my whole well, life is that. You never knew what to expect mm -hmm. next. Um, the only time that they followed fashion, I mean, it wasn't necessarily a disaster, was Hot Space. Right. But there's still some nice things on there. But generally, they never played the same song twice. Right. There was always something new, something different, something... I mean, because the thing is, you look at the last album, Innuendo, is that rock? Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me, well, what genre is Queen? And you think, well, okay, the first was sort of progressive rock. Then mm -hmm. you had the sort of classical almost style of Killer Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. Then you did have some rock songs, you know. Sheer heart attack you had. Uh, what genre are they? They're queen. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you cannot put them in one little box. It also helped that you had four guys that could all write an amazing song. <laughs> well, they're one of, I think it still is the only band where each member has written a number one hit, at least one number one hit. So... The thing is, you look at them, you look at the songs, and you can see where they come from. Basically, every song Freddie ever wrote is about love in one form or another. Um, Brian is the emotional one. Roger can sometimes be more political. And John just writes good, happy songs. <laughs> I think. I think John... I'd love to know the stats on this, but I think John's, uh, you know, in America they call it batting average, is probably the most impressive batting average of anybody who wrote yeah, a song. Out of all of them. He wrote, yeah. he wrote about half a dozen songs, of which two or three of them are some of the biggest songs ever. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you look Pretty at amazing. another one by the dust. Yeah. You're my best I mean, friend, another just... one by the dust. I mean, insane. Yeah. And I want to break free. I want um, to break free. Yeah. To break free. Another John Deacon. Yeah, insane. Yes. Such incredible yes. talent. It's uh, 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 I'll say I um, somebody somebody gave me Brian's email uh, a couple of months ago, and the weirdest thing is, is like I didn't know how to write him in an email without sounding like some rabid fan. I feel like, <laughs> and what's interesting, I was rem I was reminded um, when I work with 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 big artists, sometimes you have like interns or assistants you know, working for you, that 
sort of get overwhelmed by stardom and you just can't have them in the room. You're like, you've got to be able to, you know, be normal with somebody, even if you admire their work, because they're not looking for sycophants, they're looking for honesty. So I suppose yes. that really sort of segues into your relationship with Freddie was, is it, I presume that's what, you know, for 12 years, you know, up until he died, I mean, that must have been something he counted on with you. Well, I became, okay, all right, we'll start it at the beginning. The first song I ever heard of Queen was Seven Seas of Rye. I then heard Killer Queen, and I heard Bohemian Rhapsody. I first, well, I saw Freddie in 1973 in the Rainbow Room in Bieber. But, I mean, obviously he never said anything or anything. I mean, you know, there he was with the long hair, the fox fur jacket and the black fingernails, you know. Um, then in 1979, I saw him perform. I heard live vocals, backing track and royal ballet dancers for Crazy Little Thing Called Love, first public performance, and Bohemian Rhapsody. The job offer came one week after I spoke to him at that ballet gala. And the first thing that came to my head, because that I was offered the job of um, looking after touring costumes for the crazy tour of the UK. The first thing I thought after I'd said yes was, how many people are in the band? What are their names? What, what, what have they performed? You have to remember, this is before the internet. Right. So I had to run around asking people. I went to my first rehearsal. Um, they performed, well, no, first, before I heard the performance, um, the personal manager came over to me. I was by the wardrobe trunks, almost crying because of the state of the costumes. I mean, they'd been taken off them at the end of the last tour, rolled up and thrown into a box. They were covered in mould. They were, ah, oh, you wouldn't believe. Anyway, um, so the personal manager comes over to me and says, OK, now all the band are here. I'll introduce you to them. And I hadn't seen anybody looking like any rock star walking in, except I had seen someone in a full-length wolf skin coat that turned out to be the business manager <laughs> um, that was jim beach <laughs> he looked more like a rock star than any of them did i was introduced to them that was fine they then performed 22 songs because they were rehearsing for the crazy tour and i knew every single one of the songs i just didn't know it was by queen i became a fan of queen music in 1995, you could not be a fan and work effectively. It just would not have, it, you just couldn't have worked. It, you'd just spend your days just, mm. Yep, I understand. And, you know, if you think that I was there for the creation of so much music, the people who would come to the shows backstage and everything, I mean, the names that I really I could reel off, nobody would know who they are anymore. <laughs> I probably they were would. Huge back then. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I played video games with Michael Jackson. I've had wonderful sit-down chats with David Bowie. I've just met anybody who was anybody in those days. Um but they were not the big stars to me. They were friends of the person I worked for. Sure. And as such, they were like him. They were human beings. They were real people. And I mean, with Michael Jackson, um, the thing that will always, always stay in my mind, it was just Freddie and me there. And Michael treated me absolutely no differently than he treated Freddie. And that really stuck with me. And most of the people, almost all of the people that I've met with Freddie, through Freddie, 
were the same. They, you know, they just, there was none of this looking down their noses at anybody, you know, because if I wasn't good for Freddie, I wouldn't have been there because Freddie wouldn't have had me there. He never liked yes men around. Like you were saying, he doesn't, he couldn't deal with sycophants. There were plenty of fans out there who, if he wanted to hear how good he was, he just needed to listen to them. Sure. Um, he did not need that from people who were working for him. And so, yeah, I became a fan of the music when I started listening to it again after he died. I took a couple of years and I didn't want to listen to the music. I certainly didn't watch any videos. And the first music and video I watched was um, The Miracle. And I was watching it on a friend's sort of big screen. It was one of these, you know, the projector sort of comes up out of the table between the chairs and you had the three beams of light job doing that. You know, you're looking at 1990s. Um, <laughs> and to see a life-size Freddy coming, walking towards you, you know, when, they, when the band appeared behind the... The, you know, the young boys, to see that were, and have him walking towards me. Then I actually started listening to the music again. And that's when I fell in love with Queen music. Of course I liked it, but I loved classical music and that helped me work with rock. <laughs> I always had classical music to sort of hide away with when I just had too much of 18 hour days in studios and things. So but the thing is, even then, I mean, my favorites of Queen music are not your classical, big, popular ones. I mean, are my favorite of all time is my Melancholy Blues. I think oh, probably because, yeah. it's, it's because it's the opposite of Queen. Queen is all these multiple guitars, huge voices, choirs. And my melancholy blues is just a little piano, a voice, a bit of bass, and the... <clears throat> and that's, I love that. And you take my breath away. Oh, unbelievable song. Yeah. You know, songs like that, mm -hmm. that really, really appeal to me. Love of my life was always going to be the one for me. Yeah. And the thing is, though, it was not until maybe only two or three years ago that I actually figured it out. That it is Freddie's song for Mary, but it's not Freddie's song about Mary. Hmm. Because if you actually read the words, it's Mary saying those words, not Freddie. Wow, yeah. You hurt me. You break up. Oh, yeah. Now desert me. Love of my life. Can't you see? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because it wasn't mm -hmm. Mary walking away from Freddie. And the thing is, it, it, as I say, it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually really picked up on that. I've only just picked up on it now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome, sir. Well, thank you ever so much, Peter. I really appreciate all your time. This has been an unbelievable experience. I'm so excited to see the movie. I'm so glad that you were so closely involved in it. And I think all of the fans will love that, that you were able to bring um, your knowledge and your friendship of Freddie to that movie. I mean, that's probably, I, I just think of something. I was, I was blessed in his last few years of his life to be friends with Hubert Selwyn Jr., who wrote um, Requiem for a Dream. And when he died, the eulogy was done by, oh, I'm blanking on his name, the guy that wrote Permian, Permian Midnight. And he got up and he said they'd written this script, the Permanent Midnight script, and given it to Cubby. And Cubby had read it and said to him, when you're writing about everybody, whether you like them or dislike them, it doesn't matter. You have to write about them with love. And I yeah. think that when we watch a movie or read a book, if it's all just black and white and factual and documentary. I mean, that, that has a place, yeah. but it needs yeah. love. It, it needs it, that as love. As I said, documentary, 
That is a documentary yeah. that you have on television, yeah. and you can do hundreds of those. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, I know the feelings that were behind this film when it was being filmed, when it was being made, and they were real, genuine love. That's wonderful. That's I, I, I can already tell that from all of the trailer stuff, everything I've seen and heard. It, it, it yeah, I think it's beautiful. So because beautiful. the thing is, I mean, everybody always is always talking about Rami Malek, Rami Malek, and he, he's done an absolutely amazing job. But the casting in general is superb. It really is. It looks absolutely amazing. I'm very, very excited. Oh, I am. I am. I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. Thank you ever so much for all of your time. I really appreciate it, Peter. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. Please, everybody watching, please leave any comments and questions below. Um, thank you ever so much and have a marvellous time.